I think my favourite thing to write is Siren, the rock band oh, fiction yeah. biopic, that one. Yeah, I saw that. That's incredibly interesting. Can you tell me a little bit about it? Yeah, I mean, it was, um, I mean, I, I, I've never learned to play any musical instrument, but I, I love Same. rock music. <laughs> Same. Yeah. I like rock and I cannot play. My wife can play a guitar and whatnot. Oh, can she? Can. Oh, yeah, and piano and violin and she's a genius and oh. I, have no clue, I have no clue why she married me. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> I, I can't play an instrument to save my life. Yeah. I'm, I obviously, you obviously married you at a sense of superiority. Now look at me, I can do this. But anyway, exactly. <laughs> um, yeah, um, love rock music. Um, sort of nothing like just heavy rock or just soft rock, but a whole range of rock stuff, metal all the way down through to the even country rock, basically. But um, I was one day trying to learn to play guitar I had an acoustic guitar was bought for my birthday um when was this about 2015 i think it was and it was it was february because my other half she's an artist and she was out doing some life drawing okay and uh, in the evenings and she went on this was thursday i think it was thursday evening in february sometime and i was sat there strumming my guitar thinking i wish i'd learned to play when i was a kid and then i thought well, what would have happened if i had what would my life been you know, how different would it have been? And I sort of started to think about that. And then the cogs started going around. I thought, well, that'd be a good story. And I thought, yeah, I'll write a story, but not about, obviously, myself, but about a fictional character. And then I thought, boy, now it's all been done. Let's just make it different. Let's just do a girl. So I came up with this whole scenario of this girl who had all these disadvantages and so forth. And, um, uh, stuck her in the uh, West Midlands in England, which is where rock music really came from. Because I don't know if you know, but um, the Black Sabbath guitarist, uh, Tony Unoni, he um, was working in a metal factory in Birmingham one day in the late 60s and had an accident and cut part of his finger off. And of course, he was, to, you know, he was the guitarist for the fledgling band Black Sabbath. And he thought, oh, shit, now, what am I going to do? And, and he adapted his style and it came up with this really harsh sound or metal sound you know and he thought hey and they invented heavy metal that's how it all came about he has a prosthesis doesn't he doesn't he have a metal finger prosthesis too that he kind of plays with no i think i think it was just a sort of like clip the end off it you know so he oh, had to sort of slightly adapt the way he, he was strumming and he came up with this new style and um that's where heavy metal was born and of course, in the British bands of the late 60s, early 70s, you know, Led Zeppelin and uh, Black Sabbath and Deep Purple, they all just hit the world, didn't they? Yeah. And it's like right around home. the same time. Like yeah. England yeah. ruled the world in the 60s and 70s. It did. It did. Yeah. Yeah. And then we had a sort of like a, a sort of fade away. And then we came back again in the 80s with another whole wave of bands like White Snake and Iron Maiden and people like that, Judas Priest and, and Saxon. And I really loved that. That stuff I, mean, I was into white snake in a big way anyway mm -hmm. going gone to 2015 and i was you know sort of coming up with this story of this this band and i, I really got into it and i thought to myself why why couldn't i write songs i can't read music and so forth but i knew a couple of guys who, who did and played the guitar in a band and i was chatting to one of them in um redditch which is uh, just south of birmingham i went to see him and i told him the whole premise of this story and he um he was excited by it and the things that i was telling him about this sort of storyline that i did he said well yeah that happened to us or i know something that that happened to us and i sort of thought well either i'm very lucky or i've just got some amazing inspiration that i know how this sort of uh, to write a rock uh, band biopic well i think so right i mean it, it, it's not done people don't, i have not does i mean you said that writing about a male's protagonist was cliche and i'm like i've never yeah. heard of this type of story before well that's it and i didn't want her to sort of fall foul of the usual problems of drug addiction and so on and um i thought to myself well how am i going to avoid that because she's going to be young and impressionable and it's just going to happen yeah and the only way i could think to avoid the situation is to make her allergic so i, I looked into it and came up with all this this sort of uh, allergic reactions to various things and I thought, my goodness, you know, here it is. So I made her allergic to all kinds of things, and including the sort of painkillers, which includes all the, the, the opiates and so forth, and uh, all the South American stuff, including coffee. And <laughs> um, <laughs> 
so they were actually had an, an additional problem that she had besides being bullied and, and, and all that sort of thing. And uh, I thought well, it made a good story. And so I took it from there. And my friend said, you know, why don't you write a song? And I said, well, I would do. However, it's a big problem. I can't write music. And he said, well, I'll help you. So we, we cobbled up together very quickly um, an anti-bullying anthem called Stones. And um, we corresponded over the, the, the computer world because uh, we're about 60, 60 miles apart. And we came up with this song. And um, after about four or five weeks of sort of thrashing it out, and I was quite pleased by it, actually. And he did all the sort of the, the musical work and I did all the lyrics. And he changed some of the lyrics and I sort of changed them again. And I, I suggested a few additional musical bits in it, the, the bridge, for example, and um, as part of the chorus. And we ended up with Stones, which actually um, is being used as part of my anti-bullying project at schools in England. Um, I'm part of a kind of a small group that goes around um, primary schools. Um, interesting. Yeah, and we use that song as part of the sort of uh, anti-bullying um, seminars that we do to all these 10 year olds. Um, but the song's also been played on the BBC radio a couple of times. So that's- uh, That's kind of feel good. Yeah, it, it's amazing, you know, all right, BBC West Midlands and BBC Radio Worcester, which aren't, you know, sort of big stations, but they were played. We'll say it's <laughs> still the station. I mean, you're you're accomplishing a lot of people's dreams with. Getting, I know, I couldn't believe it. Like, them heck, yeah. So um, that's my, it, my favorite series. It sounds like you're incredibly busy. It sounds like you have. I mean, you talk about one idea that you have. I want to write a story about a band, hmm. and that turns into a program to help ten year olds and a song being played on the radio. I mean, it's yeah. one idea, and it stretches into this mammoth project that's yeah. ongoing today. It Did is, you yeah. want to work with bullies before this or had that just kind of, you know, I'm writing this story. Let me just kind of, you know, smush this in and, and see how it works out. Well, there's two golden rules in writing. First yeah, of all, you write about what you like and oh. you write about what you know. And I picked on the anti-bullying thing because at school I was bullied and, um, you know, it sort of had an effect on me for quite a long time. And... I wanted to to write this story about how I felt at the time I was being bullied. And in, in the story, the first book, Siren, the very first chapter, uh, the main character, Katie Long, is going to school with her brother, but she's dreading going there because she's badly bullied. And what she feels, what I write down in the book, is how I actually did feel myself going to school at the time when I was being bullied. Mm -hmm. uh, it was a kind of cathartic thing, really, to sort of get it out, uh, finally, after all these years. How many books are in the Siren series now? Three so far. There's a fourth one I'm writing at the very moment, and that should be out April, May. And there's going to be five altogether in the series. And it's a 35-year arc, so it basically follows a story from her 15th birthday. That's so cool. Yeah. Um, 12th of October, 1979, <laughs> um, all the way through to 2014. So, I mean, you like these long arcs, don't you? You like working in worlds that, that yeah. can basically go on forever. Yes. I love that so much. That's that's so fantastic. Um, so forty five year arc from the time that she turns, how old does she get famous? Now you start from the beginning. You start from nineteen seventy nine. Yeah, seventy nine, and the, for the first book's basically about how everything, you know, from the position of being a really disadvantaged person, bullied, and she's a girl. You know, girls don't play rock music, do they? You know, they don't oh, I mean, do that. I, I think of I think of hundreds. I mean, there's yeah. so many classic rock musicians that are women. It's hard to say no to that, right? I mean, yeah. yeah. The whole so, punk movement was filled with just gorgeous rockers. Well, yeah, yeah. And, you know, you go back to 76 with Heart. Heart. But yeah, as far as those hair bands, mold. right? Yeah. They don't really they have hair band, like female mm -hmm. rock goddesses or anything. It's usually just the guys, you know, Axl Rose is the big one or whatever have you. Yeah. Yeah. They're usually men. Usually so, men. Yeah. I mean, I've been, I've been looking at women bands as a kind of inspiration and, and sort of material for Siren, you know, Vixen, I came across the American rock band with uh, Jan Kuhneman, the guitarist, who sadly died of cancer um, a few years ago. Um, they were big for a very little period of time, just before grunge came in, because um, grunge killed off hair rock uh, in 1990, I think it was. Yeah. And um, 
there's also a band called Thunder Mother, which is a Swedish band. There's there's um, Hailstorm, um, Lizzie Hale. I don't know if you've, you've you heard of them. They're American band. So she's got a hell of a voice on that. Um, but they're they're going now. They're a sort of modern band. Um, well, I mean, what's interesting though also is that you're writing in a time where women being subjugated like that not yeah. subjugated maybe that's the wrong choice of word but treated poorly because they're weaker mm. or because they're women is as a very proper conversation to be having well yeah because i i used actually she was exploited you know this me too movement yeah, got exactly you know, well, you know, she was a victim of that kind of uh, of situation um so in book uh, one uh, and book two um i explore some of that uh, yeah what did issue. i read recently one out of every three women has a has a horrible story like that yeah yeah so, i mean it's good that it's getting out i like it and authors like you you know telling those stories is very important mm. well it's yeah it's 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 told from um her point of view i mean sometimes her character isn't that likable because she, for what she has to do she has to be quite um aggressive and hard and stand up for herself and she's not the archetypal soft gooey woman and i think some people have a difficulty with with relating to that but if she's going to be a success in that kind of business um with a lot of it's based on image then she has to be a certain kind of person now yeah. well, individual right i mean strong-willed yeah, yeah she is very that. strong -willed. you know she she the character i wrote um and still i'm writing She's got a very fixed idea of where she wants to be. It doesn't always go the way she wants it to be, but she does her best to to make it come about. What does it look like when you start a series like this, four books in? Do you look at decades down the road, or is there an end, is there an end point for you? There is an end point for Siren, um, because when I thought up the series, I came up with this particular story arc right from the word go. So it was a case of filling in all the, the waypoints. Um, I came up with some very big moments all the way along. So I said, right, this is going to happen then. That's going to happen then. And that's going to happen then. So what do I do to link them? And that's what the books are all about. And uh, um, I, I, I actually, all throughout 2015, the first, what, five months, I suppose, I, I spent a lot of emotional time thinking up this this storyline. It kept me awake at nights uh, quite a lot of the time, actually. That's interesting. Yeah. How, how long are they, about 40,000 each, or what's the word count? Word count, oh, 112,000, I think it is, 120,000. For the four books all together, or each? No, each book. Oh, wow, that's a big that's a big endeavor. Yeah, I wrote Siren in one month. I, five, wow, man, that's a big chunk <laughs> of writing in one month. <laughs> How'd that feel when you were finished? I bet you were proud of yourself. I felt drained. Yeah. Is that normal for you? I mean, I mean, going back to the beginning of the mm -hmm. conversation, looking at your website, you're not you. I mean, you're I mean, how many series do you have written writing four. right now? Four. four. There's, there's four on the go. Um, the, the Castle have, series that, is the well, main one. The cat, I'm going to tell you a story. Um, uh, when I was nine years old, I was in Germany. My dad was stationed in Bergheim. And just this soldier was reading a casket book sitting at a desk. I never read it. I just he told me the story of what it was. Yeah, it infatuated me as a child all the way up until I actually did read one like five or six years ago. Mm -hmm. That story, you know, not even having read the book, but having written that book many times, I had no clue what it was called. I had no clue who wrote it. I had no clue that that story basically created my my writing, basically, just trying to recreate what was in that book that I never got to read. It did inspire so, me, actually, I must admit, when I read my first Casca story back in 86. Um, he, he, when did he die? When did Barry Sadler die? Was 1990, I think, or 1989. Uh, 89, okay. It was, it was just after his birthday, actually, because he, he was born in November and I was born in November. So, you know, there's a little bit of a link for you. That's great. Were you in the military as well? No, no, I wasn't. No. Um, never went into the military. My dad was in the army. Um, he, he was actually in the British army just after the Second World War finished. He was based in Vienna. And he was saying that, you know, there was the four powers there, like in Berlin, uh, Vienna was the same. And he said that um, what amazing thing is, well, when he was walking the streets of Vienna, there was one thing that was missing, that were cats. Because the poor old population was so starved, they actually ate all the cats. I could imagine. I mean, you go to war, right? You think of the Battle of the Bulge, you think of storming the beach of Normandy. 
But you don't really think about these guys that are in these towns after the battles no. are over with, kind of holding down the peace. The now, for every, for every, right? They've got every, all these stupid jobs to do. <laughs> oh, I, know, I know. For every glamorous story, if you can get glamorous stories in war, because you can't can really, but you know what I mean, there's always a really horrible one to sort of balance it, um, and which we don't like hearing about, but they are there. And mm -hmm. I tend to like writing some of these things about uh, what happened that you don't hear about. I mean, for example, in one of the early Casca books I wrote, um, I think it was the Battle of Antietam or Sharpsburg, depending on which side of the border you are. Is that Rebel so, Yell? That, I own that one. Yeah, That's on my bookshelf. Yeah. 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 Um, Burnside was the um, commander of, I think, the Ninth Corps, and he was ordered by, I think it was Hooker who was in charge, I'm not sure, uh, to, to outflank the, the Rebel army, who was outnumbered. Mm. And his men mutinied. They refused to cross the brook to attack the exposed right flank of the, uh, the the rebel army because they hadn't been given their whiskey ration for three days. <laughs> and they refused point blank to actually march until the generals gave in and gave all these uh, Union soldiers the, uh, the whiskey. And by the time they drunk and said that they were ready, reinforcements arrived. <laughs> or I think it was General Bell, R.H. Bell, I think it was. Anyway, um, Oh, I can't think it might be someone else, but uh, the, the reinforcements arrived from um, uh, Harper's Ferry. They've just been looting the, the whole thing and, and uh, equipped themselves, and they just plugged the gap literally just in time. So the war might have taken a different uh, course it hadn't been for that whiskey ration. It's interesting, isn't it? Um, and the, the whole Civil War battle line that runs all the way through that area is fascinating. I've been to Gettysburg. Oh, yeah. It's my only big battlefield that I've been to. Um, I mean, why? I mean, I guess you write about how many different conflicts when you deal with Casca as a character. Well, I mean, how... I've written 23 Casca books now. So I've actually overtaken Barry Sadler and the number of, of, of Casca novels I've written because he was attributed with 22. Um, how many did he actually write? Can you even talk about that? <laughs> It's, you know, because I mean, the rumor is he ghost wrote like a lot, right? I mean, it yeah. was like he wrote the first one and then whatever wrote, happened afterwards. He wrote a number of them and he started a lot, but he never actually got around to finishing quite a few. Um, the most famous one I know of is the Mongol, the last one, because when he died or when he was wounded in Guatemala, shot himself, of course, although some people will say it's a sniper, that was that's rubbish. Um, he was flown to. Um, the Veterans Hospital in Tennessee, I believe. Um, but when they went to his place in Guatemala, they found his, I'm not sure what it was, a computer or a typewriter or something weird, this story that he'd mostly mostly written called The Mongol. And the, only the very last chapter was written by somebody else. And then the publisher um, published it. It was the last one that was done for him. So, you know, you look at that and say, yeah, that's a, a Sadler book up to the last chapter. And then the pace changes and the style changes. But there's a couple of other books like that. You think, hmm, is that the same person writing all of it? I mean, there's a couple of books, definitely, which I think he was not responsible for. Um, but of the 22, I reckon he probably wrote all of half of them. And then the other half were either partly or not written by him at all. This character is not Barry Sadler's either. I mean, this is like a hardcore literary character that's been around since the crucifixion of Christ. It's in the Bible, right? Yeah. yeah. He's a very clever idea, actually, what he did. Um, I don't know whether he was his pure idea or somebody suggested it to him, we don't know. But taking the, the, this Roman soldier who speared Jesus on the cross and then turned him into an immortal soldier and made him the central character to a whole series of action, adventure, military um, stories, well, I think was great. Um, but he has humanity too, doesn't he? He like, yeah. he lives forever, but he feels every moment of it. Feels like when you're reading, yeah. yeah. I try and bring a bit of that to to the stories. You know, I don't try to change too much because obviously it was Barry Sadler's creation, and he he wrote the first books, and a lot of the fans wouldn't like it if I changed too much. And so I try to sort of keep to the the whole concept of the story and, and the character but i do try and bring in some more humanity to him than in some of the the earlier books and the feeling that it's not a blessing it's a curse and 
you can't settle that anywhere and it's a real pain in the backside. I love it. I mean, I think such a great idea. Uh, I mean, do you feel haunted by the the original author as you're writing? I mean, I'll tell you, I've read um, Rebel Yell. I mean, I'm not the biggest uh, Barry Sadler reader, you know? Yeah. Uh, he Romantically, he really affects me. But mm. I haven't read all of them. But what I noticed when I read old uh, Rebel Yell is that there is a big similarity between that writing and his. Like, I could see that first book in your writing. So do you feel haunted by him as an artist over your shoulder as you're creating these stories? Um, I, I had to adjust my writing a little bit to suit the style. I wouldn't say I was haunted by him. I am haunted by some people who have had a go at me right. for not being Barry Sadler. Um, Explain. I was going to ask that too, how sensitive people are. Because, I mean, yeah. is it typical when an author passes, dies, suicide, right? He's a special forces guy. He wrote a really famous song, the Green Beret song, right? And then he wrote this series, and he's not really well known for writing this series outside of his fan base. But the series now has you're the third author writing on it. Um, third, yes. You're third. Yeah. There, there were actually there was another author who um, his two books who have been removed from the series. <laughs> so that would make it four. Yeah, he got he was plagiarizing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was a quite unpleasant uh, <laughs> series of incidents. But anyway, that's that's been dealt with now. Um, yeah, I'm the third one. Um, some some of the, the fans have sort of asked, why am I doing it? And criticising me for that. Or oh, you're not Barry Sadler. You know, you're an, some of them have been quite insulting. I would say about 90%, 95% of, of the readers are happy with what I'm trying to do and what I'm, I'm, I'm keeping the torch going, so to speak. But there's always, there's always some. You can't please everybody. And, you know, you just have to sort of like, ride it um and you just say okay fine you know that's your opinion great you know if you don't like the series don't buy it um, right because i mean if you're buying it you know of it i mean you will if you I mean, if you discover it are you discovering it from barry sadler or are you discovering it from you at this yeah. point yeah. are you bringing on new fans do you think to the casca series or is I, it kind of lingering where it was with these old people there, there's a lot of people who um I've come across from the Barry Sadler reading uh, era. Um, I think there are a few new ones. There's not a lot. I mean, a lot of these people who um, buy from me are in or well, my age or older. Mm. Uh, sadly, you know, some of them are passing on now. Uh, um, a couple of years ago, I lost about three people who kept corresponding with me. Uh, wow. It was you know, a little bit difficult, so, but you know, there you are. Um, but there are some new ones coming through, some of the people who discover series and they keep asking me will the older ones be reprinted and um four of them have but i don't think there's going to be um a big push unless something happens with the series where it becomes mainstream you know it's it it always was a little bit of a sort of niche series mm -hmm. even more so now you can't find any i can't find anybody that's ever heard of it i'm like did you get you got these books and then you send them to the internet and they're you can't find them there either or they look like they're a different price than other books or whatnot it's the incredibly only, interesting yeah the only places you can buy them is either on amazon that's from the um publisher themselves who have their own shop um or ebay where people sell them on uh or from my website um and i sell them for the actual retail price and the only thing that's different is the postage cost. So the people in the States will pay a little bit extra in the postage. I keep it as low as I possibly can. The price of the books has not increased since 2006. I will hasten to add. So, you know, if they're moaning about the value, that's your value. Not <laughs> yeah. at all. Not one cent. And, you know, my, my profit margin has correspondingly gone down every year with the increase in the postage costs. But we're not putting the prices up not yet anyway um so you know if it comes to a point where we need to we'll have a discussion with the publisher and myself about it but um. well that's that's also very interesting too because i'm um, originally they were published i'm trying to look through berkeley berkeley and now yeah. you you're publishing through somebody else americana americana that's right do they buy the rights at one point or another? Because how does that work yeah. exactly? I mean, it's very interesting that you came to start writing these stories. It's so mm. cool. And yeah. I read that you went to them and said, let's start doing this. They must have had the rights already. 
mm. with the author that you replaced, right? Or the one that got fired or whatever happened there. Yeah. Well, what happened, uh, because um, it took me 13 years to collect the original 22 books from the Sadler, I, um, I was then sort of like just in the process of getting the internet. It was 1999. And I thought, well, somebody should own the series. And I looked around, I couldn't find any website. So I started one myself completely voluntarily. And then I got hold of the man who was the franchise owner at the time, a man called Gary Sizemore. And now he was Barry Sadler's agent and friend. And he was the person who contracted the second writer, Paul Dan Galegi, um, sort of a Romanian immigrant to the United States who became a, a dentist, um, to write the next books in the series. He wrote The Liberator and The Defiant. And I actually was in correspondence with Paul Dengleggi as well through the website because I was trying to reach out to everybody. You know, had you uh, had you written anything up to that point? What? Yeah, because I had or was in the process of collecting the, the series, I, I wanted to do my own writing and uh, I felt this compulsion to do so because I felt that the series, because I knew there's only 22 books in the series, I thought it needs to be continued. So I started writing my own uh, Casca stories. I was writing four so sort of alongside each other, I was going back to one and leaving it for you know, a few months, come back and do a bit more. But these four books, um, one was Scourge of Asia, one was The Last Defender, one was The Moor, and the other one was The Avenger. And eventually, um, decided to finish them in 2005, um, because by then Gary Sizemore had sadly died of cancer. Uh, oh, yeah. yeah, actually, I got an email from Thor Sadler, the Barry's eldest son, because I've been corresponding with him briefly, and he told me that, that Gary had passed away. I knew Gary wasn't very well. Um, Paul Dengleggi, his contract was not renewed, and Berkeley, who Jove Books or Charter Books, wh whom you find uh, the, were the print prints for the uh, original series, Berkeley owned them, and Berkeley pulled out. They said, no, we're not going to be involved with this anymore. Um, so suddenly these three things happened and I thought the series was going to die. So I was trying to find out who owned the rights and the Vona Sadler, Barry's widow, um, I found out she, she owned the rights, but she wasn't in a position to, to sort of do anything about it financially. And eventually one of the people I'd had corresponded with, Gail Ryan, who had worked with, with, um, Gary Sizemore, he took over, he got a, a deal going with Lavona. And he was the new CEO of the new company. And they were looking for a writer. And he emailed me and said, do you know of anybody? I said, yeah, me. And I just sent him one of the completed books. I just, well, the story I just finished, The Scourge of Asia. And he, he sort of looked at it. He said, well, yeah, I think we can do something with this. Um, but I don't want you to publish this one or to, 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 to have this one done. I want something on the American Civil War. And I thought, well, yeah, that's, that's a sound enough idea. And that's how I started writing for them because i was in the right place at the right time it was, it was pure luck but there completely you go. unfair <laughs> <laughs> i did all the hard work in setting the website up you know come on <laughs> yes yeah, it's, it's very it's very true actually i mean you found a fandom before i mean you are actually sitting on a really good fandom mm. I'm, I'm disappointed i mean you talked about it maybe breaching i don't know pop culture do you see a way to do that or what's keeping it from doing that? Why didn't it catch on? I mean, what about this story didn't resonate enough to make it pop? Because nobody knows about it. I mean, I you have to have had in an introduction to get the disease of Casca, yeah, Lungaria, yeah. or whatever. There's, I think two ways of going about it. It's one to make it as controversial as hell and get into the news that way, and then people will be so intrigued they'll buy it. Um, or you'll need somebody with a lot of money to push it. I don't know. You guys already have all this content. If you have all the books, I would make anthologies, right? I would put them all together. I would make four book anthologies, start selling them on Amazon, something, something, something. Yeah. The unfortunate thing is, though, I, I just recently got into an anthology with a short story. No, that short story was, it was two of them, actually. And when they published it and I got a physical copy in my hand, it was, like, not good. You know, the typeface is off mm. throughout the entire cop, throughout the entire publishing, the, the book. And you really have to be careful, don't you? You don't want to besmirch what you're trying to sell. Well, it's true. And it's also true with the often touted 
film or TV series of Casca? Because that's been a perennial question and a number of people have come forward offering. And for one reason or another, none have actually got gone through to the actual um, release. Now, if that happened, then I think Casca would be quite big. But the trouble is, of course, you know what's going to happen. It'd be like Highlander. And the number of times people have likened Casca to Highlander, um, I would actually turn around and say, no, Highlander is like Casca. Because Highlander was written in about 1983 by a Canadian student. I can't remember his name. Casca came out in 1979. Now, we'll never know this, but what's to say that this Canadian student didn't read Casca while he was a student and then thought, hey, I can do this and wrote his own version. And then it's an awesome idea, right? I have an idea for a guy that doesn't die. You know, I have a reason that it doesn't happen because of Casca. Mm. You know, from being a child, I wrote that story over and over and over again. Yeah. Completely captiv captivated my imagination. You as well. To yeah. the point where you're actually the owner of the Casca series by name at this point. I mean, I'm not an it, owner. I'm, I'm the writer. I write on behalf of the franchise. I'm, I, I wish I did, was the owner. Because I, I don't know what Bar I don't know what Barry Sandler did. I mean, where did this story come from? Because it really does kind of punch you in the imagination yeah. and say, "Hey, I mean, pay attention to me. I want to write some stories about this." He might have watched the film The Robe with Richard Burton because that's very similar in parts to that particular section of the franchise. that is about a slave that doesn't die right just oh. lives for like four caesars or something along those lines right is it about the robe the robes the, the soldiers sharing out jesus's robe while he's being crucified and one of them um becomes uh, immortal i think okay, so yeah. i think sadler looked at that and thought yeah i can take this on and do my own take of it so um yeah, we'll never know where he got the idea from, but he, he wrote it sometime in 1977, 78. And his manager and agent, Gary Sizemore, got it published because of Sadler's name in connection with um, the Ballad of the Green Beret. And it's no secret yeah. uh, that, that they were based, based in Nashville. And, you know, it's where all the music was. And of course, the Ballad of the Green Beret was a big hit for the music industry. And uh, he was based in Nashville. So they, they obviously knew people in the uh, the business and uh, somebody said, yeah, we'll get this published. Barry Sadler's a good name. And it, two million books um, published in the first 22 uh, of the series. So, you know, you, you, not to sniff at. That, yeah, it's nothing. Yeah, that's pretty good. Um, so, I mean, what, he was a Vietnam vet too, wasn't he? He, I, he had a punji stick injury to his foot. Yeah. yeah. And he was but, out of the military. If you watch the video of the Green Beret being sung by him on national TV, He's out of the military by that point. He was in E5, Special Forces. He he was a medical sergeant, I think, and he was on patrol. He got his leg infected, uh, excrement-covered punji stick, and he was mm -hmm. lying in the hospital. And he he thought to himself, if, if he pulls through, he will dedicate the proceeds of Ballad of the Green Beret to the military. And then, of course, the word got out, and they got an orchestra in, and they, they, they recorded it, and it became number one in 66, didn't it? So, but yes, he, he, he was grateful to the um, people saving his leg that he, he wrote it. In fact, in, in many ways, he became America's only Vietnam hero. That's interesting. Because everybody um, else was vilified, weren't they? Was Chuck Norris a Vietnam vet or was he just in the Air Force in Asia um, at one point or another? Possibly. I mean, Chuck Norris was more a martial arts person than a soldier. Um, you, you obviously had uh, military service, but he was mostly a martial arts fella. And um, yeah, he, he his his series Braddock, you know, missing in action kind of thing. Um, that was sort of a bit um, pie in the sky, wasn't it? it was, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, and most movies in the eighties were pie in the sky. Well, yeah. it, was, it was canon, wasn't it? It's Golan Globus. I mean, they just love to have a whole fantasy about. Uh, the, the Vietnam War. Oh, yes, we didn't lose. We won. But no, you didn't. You lost. Yeah. But, yeah. Well, I mean, it wasn't what were you trying to win? You were trying to change hearts and minds by blowing people up. It doesn't really <laughs> work that way, right? <laughs> that doesn't make point. any sense. It just doesn't no, make no. any sense. We're doing that in the Middle East. I mean, everybody's trying to do that in the Middle East. Well, just devastate sense. the place and then wonder why they're being terrorists. And why are you being so mean to us? We just wanted well, to lay 
down suppress a fire on you. Iraq, Iraq, um, when when the war was over and they, they destroyed Saddam Hussein and smashed everything up, there was actually, funny enough, I mean, I'm not going to say anything here uh, as to why, but the one industry that had its, all of its uh, facilities and, and structures intact was the oil industry. <laughs> There was no burning. There was no burning wells this time, were there? Uh, they were intact. They smashed yeah. up every uh, other industry, and then lo and behold, British and American companies went in to rebuild it. Which is very interesting because the same people that we were fighting were destroying like ancient relics. Yes, and whatnot. Oh, they, they didn't destroy the oil, and it doesn't make sense. Yeah, you're right. Well, story, they were selling uh, the crap out of that, weren't they? That's what I heard. Anyway. It was an American tank or um, self-propelled gun that was wanting to do some target practice and they saw this structure in the distance and they radioed um through to their headquarters say look we've got, we see this thing in the distance can we blow it up and there was a bit of a discussion and somebody came back and said no it's a ziggurat leave it alone oh all right they didn't know what it was you know it's it it about six thousand year old structure and they were going to blow the hell out of it i mean and they I had a Tell that they they go go at the Taliban for blowing things up. Well, you know, come on. The, 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 it's really interesting. I mean, you write about a soldier, and the soldier is the smallest bolt or nut in the machinery. Right? Doesn't really know what's going on. If, it, if he's told to uh, shoot around at something, that's what the soldiers are going to do. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's it's disappointing because if you read the Casca series, that's what he always is, isn't it? He never mm-hmm. manages to become something more than that as oh, a soldier. He does. He does. He does. I mean. Barry Sadler himself, book two, God of Death, he becomes a god. Um, well, it, yeah, it, it, that was such a great, that was a great, I own that one too. That's such a great story, but he's sacrificed at the end, right? I he mean, is, they take yeah. his heart, yeah. or they do it in the well, beginning. I can't remember which one. He, in the end, he, his girl gets killed by the main bad guy, and he decides to return back to the, the first world rather than stay with the, the second world. Um, but in some of my stories, he does actually become a little bit more than just the grunt. Um, but I think Sergeant is his highest rank. Yeah, favorite rank. Yeah, he, uh, that very, was, uh, he was in the German army when he was a sergeant, I think. That yeah, was very that was interesting. Too. Put him in the, the Wehrmacht, wasn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And there's there a very interesting um, story I heard about Panzer Soldier, the number four. And that, if you look at the book itself, it seems to support the theory that Barry Sadler started it, and yet it was finished by somebody else. And if you if you go through Panzer Soldier, there's about two thirds of the way through, it suddenly changes, because you've got all these chapters going up to that particular page, and suddenly the pace of the book changes, the whole emphasis of the book changes, and it's one chapter for the entire last third of the book, which is crazy. Well, we're not dealing with uh, somebody potentially with all of his faculties, right? Because in 89, you said he shot himself in the head. He killed well, himself. he didn't write anything after that. You know, this, this was 1981, 82, he was writing Panzer Soldier. You know, he, he, wasn't, he didn't get shot in the head until 88. After well, I'm he, saying, though, that there's got to be some kind of disease working its way up to the suicide or yeah, accidal death, he was, right? He was waving his pistol around in a, in a taxi and it went over a bump in the road and the, and the gun went off. He was with a prostitute and it, it, was, it was a complete accident. It was a complete... It know, was the an guy, accident. Yeah, the, guy, the guy was was drunk. Um, he'd been all day carousing in this bar and he picked up this, this prostitute. He got in the taxi. They were driving along the highway. They went over a bump or a pothole and he was waving his pistol about showing off and the thing went off and blew half his head off. Um, and that's what happened. You know, you, you, people can glamorize what happened and, and so forth. But that's, that's the nuts and bolts of it. No, that is exactly what I read. I forgot. I had read yeah. that. I read that exact same thing. So <laughs> that's such a horrid ending. But it was a, he had such a great life, though. Didn't he stab a country music singer as well? Or um, he shot somebody between the eyes um, in an argument over a girl. Um, the guy was reaching for his car keys. And I said I thought he was reaching for his gun and shot him dead. And he got 30 days in jail for that. <clears throat> That's why I love the guy. What a, what a fantastic <laughs> story. I always wondered, honestly, what would it be like if you wrote a screenplay? But it's Barry Sadler, mm. you know, writing the story as a Casca throughout the, the, the movie as it's progressing. So, I mean, you get the Casca, but you also get the Barry Sadler. The I Barry think... Sadler, to me, is such a fantastic character and a part yeah. of this whole epic. Well, you could write, a, you know, story about barry sadler because that's a hell of a story in itself you know that would but be you a can't, I, 
But how many books did he write for tour? Like he didn't just write Casca. He wrote a bunch of other stuff too. He did, yeah, a shooter series, and he wrote um, Seppuku, Funam, Run for the Sun, um, The Moy, and there was a Gladiator ones as well. So he's writing an awful lot. Um, an awful lot. If you consider that he was in Guatemala since after 83 he went there after this shooting this fellow in between the eyes and he was also um, gun running for the Contras he was um, training mercenaries and he was writing allegedly two casket books a year plus all these other books he didn't have the time to do all that no wonder half of them were ghost written right what was he really doing what was the real story good question we'll never know we'll never know I mean that's that's what I love about it because you could write you could develop this story about this guy that's just kind of lost in this fantasy. Yeah. What did we know about him really? I mean, was he really Green Beret? Probably. Now I'm just oh, much a war right. hero because probably, right? And that's never been, to, it's never been a question that he was a war hero. What has it? Well, he was a war hero because of the selfless uh, nature of, of his, his donation of the proceeds of the song to the military and the military loved him. Um, and I suppose quite rightly so. And so he was elevated to this kind of you know, a great guy status. And mm. in Vietnam, nobody else was a great guy. He suddenly stood out and he attracted this kind of myth to him. I mean, I'm, there are people who have written um, to me um, about Casca and, and they, 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 they're glowing in their terms about you know, Barry Sattler, but they never didn't know him. I mean, I've spoken or uh, corresponded with people who did know him. You know, and he was he was a great guy to know as a friend, um, but was he great to know as a, a family person? I don't know. A lot of fun to know as a friend, right? I bet the guy was always partying. I bet he, oh, yes. he had a lot of fun hanging out, Barry Sadler. Yeah, and he was he was always you know throwing his money around, and <laughs> uh, the advances he got for his uh, books <laughs> went very quickly, shall we say? <laughs> I mean, what, what we're working with here is Barry Sadler was a very man's man, right? Writing these yes. very, very man's man's book. Like, Cask is very, he's very id-focused, right? Barry Sadler broke Casca, and Casca was an extension of a lot of what Barry Sadler was. Mm -hmm. What he wanted, what he found valuable in himself, too. Yeah. Being able yeah. to withstand pain and discomfort. I mean, Battle of Special Forces in the 1960s um, was different than during my time, but they really put themselves in a lot of painful situations over and over and over again. I mean, that's the nature of it, right? It's mind over mission, getting through it as opposed to, you know, giving up because you're in a little bit of discomfort. And that's a theme throughout the Casca series, isn't it? Getting through discomfort, being buried alive for 100 years yeah. and yeah. being and, and aware of it. Yeah, and the terror. Yeah. terror. Pain, burned from hunger. He's he burned as well in one of the um, books, um, the Brotherhood of the Lamb, the the bad guys. One of them gets him burned by uh, this fanatical um, king in Persia, and that's a horrendous scene. To it's horrendous scene too. It's really well written. You feel it, yeah. and he lives yeah. with it. It's yeah. not like a vampire. It's not like Anne Rice. I mean, Anne Rice writes about an internal life too, doesn't she? Yeah, yeah. The, the old, vampire uh, lady. The vampire stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah but she, she doesn't have the. I mean, this guy has to heal. It takes time. It does, yeah. Um, but he does heal. He does get better. I mean, ultimately, yeah, at the end of the day, he does have the knowledge that the that pain is temporary, that yeah. eventually he will recover and be whole again. Well, the book I'm writing, I've just finished um, writing. It's in the draft for the moment called The Commissars. It's about the, the Russian Revolution, 1917 to 1919. He gets mixed up in that. And there's a passage there where he knows he's, he's charging forward with all the uh, – he's, he's on the side of the Reds to start off with. Um, because he thinks that they have a as, as nice a, a sort of way of, of freeing the peasants of Russia as anybody. Mm -hmm. um, so he's so, with the Bolsheviks at the beginning of the story. The beginning, yeah, and then he finds out what they're really like. You know, part murderous, of rampaging mob, <laughs> basically. He's charging across this frozen ground towards the um, the the Ukrainian, because there's a, a civil war in Ukraine, so he's part of the, the Reds trying to turn it into a, a Soviet Republic. And he's thinking to himself, I don't want to get hit because it hurts. And, yeah. you know, <laughs> yeah. and that's true. You know, he, he's immortal. He doesn't want A to be shot because it'll be agony. 
And B, the other guys will say, well, hang on a second, you're meant to be dead. What's going on here? You know? As war is done, right? I mean, that's it brings up an interesting point that I wanted to talk to you about before um, getting on, the, on this hangout. What do you do in terms of the timeline? Do you have it all mapped out to where this character has been since zero to now? I have to. You have to, right? I mean, he's in, obviously, he's fighting the Russians yeah. in 1919. So yeah. he can't be anywhere else. He but he has to also go, go someplace from Russia. He's going to die. He can't live no longer in that soldier's body. That's right. That cog is gone. He has to rematerialize someplace else. Does so it take has, 18 years? Yeah. So basically, what I did when I started, well, even before I started writing the casting, was I had a, a whole timeline of what he was doing, where he'd been, even, even in books where he, it was mentioned that he'd done something. You know, where, is that on the internet? Is that on the website? Um, my timeline on my website. Is there a timeline on the website? I didn't see it. <laughs> I would love to see like an interactive map with all the dates and what he's done to impact history, right? Yeah. That'd be so incredible. Go onto my website. I'm just going to actually um, access it. Yeah, the front page of my website, it's got Casca's timeline. And it's got part two, part three, part four, part five, part six, part seven. So, you know, it's all broken down into those parts. So if you click on Casca's timeline and then it'll tell you, from oh, to where he was, where we worked out he was born, all the way through to was was, but it goes up to the first page, eighty four five three. So, I've broken it down into into those. So, you know where he's been in those particular years, even if it's just mentioned in a book as an aside. You know, in, for example, the trench soldier, which was number twenty one in the series, it mentioned Agincourt. So, right, he was at Agincourt. So when I came to write one of the, the, the books, number 41, I wrote about Agincourt because it had already been said he was there. So, you know, that was it. Done. And so this was your first book, right? The first one that you wrote was for Casca, the first three? Yeah. You said the first four anyway that you were writing and they and you just happenstance being in the right place at the right time? It was at the right time. The, the four books that I'd written in 2000, well, finished in 2005, weren't publish them because he didn't want them he wanted a, the american civil war yeah and so i started looking into it and he said oh i also want you to refer back to the uh, the mexican war and i went what the alamo he went, no 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 no, the mexican war and i thought right i'm english i don't know anything about that, I'll look <laughs> that. and i thought bloody hell I didn't know about this war. And the Americans got so much. They got California. They got all these other territories. Yeah, we really screwed over Spain. <laughs> yeah, thought, and then the more I read about that war, I thought, this is a war in itself. And then I, I started writing about this, this, this story about the Mexican War, not about the American Civil War. And of course, my publisher had jumped up and down. He said, I'm worried about the American Civil War. No, no, no. I said, believe me, go with this. We'll do a trilogy. We'll do this one and then two on the American Civil War. And it'll be great. He said, well, I don't know. I want the American Civil War. I've also come up with a title for the first book because I'd seen it in, in this military book I was writing because they, they stormed the fortress of Chapultepec outside Mexico City, the, the Marines. And it was, someone said, the halls of Montezuma. I thought, well, I know about that. That's, that's John Wayne film. I thought, I'll use that as a book title. So I said to the, the publisher, look, halls of Montezuma. And he just went absolutely ape over it. And he thought, yeah, yeah, we'll go with that. We'll go with that. Brilliant. So that's how I managed to sell the first book to him. Um, but it, it was edited. Um, we had somebody also doing editing, which had a bit of a conflict between uh, myself and him. And when the second book, Johnny Reb, uh, was, was started, I was sort of straight jacketed into a process I didn't like. And there was a bust up. And I don't like working alongside anybody. You know, I have to write my own thing, my own way. Um, that's just me. You know, I'm, I'm not a team player as far as that's concerned. And in the end, the other guy had to go. And I was then free to write how I wanted to, you know, so which is why if you look at the first three books, the style changes slightly. Um, and if I, if I was honest with myself, I'm not happy with the first three books. Um, I would go back and change them, but you can't, they're out. And that's it. But when the Civil War trilogy was finished and the next book to come along, I said to the publisher, look, we've got to do a sword era one because we've done gun eras. Let's do a sword era. Another argument. 
in the end, I won because the fans wanted a, a sword era book, and he listened to them. And so I had the, 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 the book, The Avenger, ready written. So that came out. And eventually, I do plan to release all the books that I have written before I actually started working for the franchise. Um, the other one that came out was Scourge of Asia. That came out at number 43. And number 51 will be the Saracen, which is something I wrote in 2005, just as I got the job with the Casca franchise. How many books are there altogether? Um, 49 have been published. Two have been withdrawn due to plagiarism. And how many do you think you'll publish before the end? You, oh, you can, sorry, do you no. have hopes? That you'll just keep going. Okay, go ahead. Until I'm, no, I'm sacked or I die. Yeah, do, you, do, you, do, you, do you plan on writing more? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah Does it frustrate you that you can't do anything with those first, what we say it was, 22 books? What's done is done. I mean, some of those books are really good. Um, a lot As a of fan, it frustrates me because I can't find them anywhere. It makes me really mad. Well, it makes me really mad that there's an awesome, you know, it's an awesome. To I bet, come to my website. I've got a stock of most of them. Most of them. Yeah, I, I haven't got 23. I haven't got 17, but I've got all the others. You can get them from me. And what are you going to do with them at the end of the day, though? I mean, is there a vision for all 49 books? That's that in the hands of the franchise owner. I'm just yes. continuing to write and I'm keeping this series on life support. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. You know, right. So life support. That's a great way to look at it. Yeah. So, I mean, what, I mean, it could have legs or when you, I'm, I talk to a lot of independent authors, right? Yeah. I talk to a lot of people who write their stories and they get them out there and a lot of people buy them mm -hmm. and they're constantly churning out content so they can, you know, keep the, the fans happy. Yeah. And I'm only aware of Casca because of a private sitting at a table at a gymnasium when I was mm. nine years old. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? If I had to talk to that guy and then had that, you know, orgasm of imagination that lasted yeah. you know, 30 years or whatever, does Casca remain strong? Do I find him in another way? No. At no. the moment, Amazon, which I would rather people not buy from because Amazon get such a huge cut in fees. I've had to withdraw yeah. books from Amazon in the UK because I don't make any money selling on Amazon. I actually lose money. Yeah, right. I mean, so and I'm, I'm you've got this really, I think, you know, ultimately what the really coolest thing here is that it is a dark horse, isn't it? Somebody's going to come from behind. Mm -hmm. It's not something that, I mean, you said 2 million books, right? That the yeah. guy sold before he passed. Yeah. But that was a long time ago. If we talk to anybody now, they don't know. So you could actually get someplace with this character potentially later on. You said you've been optioned or people have talked to you about television series in the past. Yeah, I mean, it's not my decision because it goes through the franchise owners. Um, but there, there have been a number of people who, over the years I've been connected with the franchise, who have come forward and said, look, you know, we want to do a TV series or a film. And they, they've they paid the franchise owners options. And, you know, do they really involve you in the process of creating the, the, the content? No. No, they don't. Even I've been kept well away from it. Um, it's unfortunate. You seem you're the make the master of everything at this point. Well, you would think so, right? You know, I've got you know a lot of input. I mean, if they want to do a film and there's a screenplay, I could have some input to it. Right. But I I got the feeling they'll do what Highlander did, and that's to base it in modern day and have flashbacks, and which it's yeah, it's cheaper. But the Casca fans won't like it because they want to see the books in film or TV form. I want to see the humanity and the pain. I want to see what this character's gone through because of war and humanity, mm. right? And you want to kind of, I mean, obviously we have not talked about it, but you really kind of have to put the, the, the Christ figure in this too, don't you? You have a mythology to play with. You, you do at the beginning. Um, when I, I start explaining to people who don't know about it, that it's all about the soldier who speared Jesus on the cross. You can see them looking at me. And I said, no, yeah. it's not a religious series. It's nothing to do it's with It's not a religious series at all, but if you throw the Jesus name in there, it's like, oh, no, I don't yeah. want it. Well, that's that's the potential dark horse for selling the series. It could lead to a lot of controversy. Controversy, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. What do you do about it? Do you address it when you're writing? Do you do you address it? You... I said, well, hang on a minute. He's the son of God. What would God do? God flattened an entire uh, army, the Egyptian <laughs> army, the Red Sea, didn't he? He, he, he sunk sort of like Noah. assault. I mean, yeah. He drowned the of Noah. You know, he, mm. he's going to have a bit of a, a fit of pig, isn't he? 
So, you know, the sun just cursing a guy to immortality is nothing in comparison to that. What is the through line, do you think, for Casca? I mean, looking at Sandler, you're the author of the series now. Jesus died. He drank the, some of the blood, right? He drank blood mixed with the wine and the vinegar or something along those lines. So I can't remember hand, exactly. He put, onto his hand and he put his hand to his face in the reflex of that Jesus saw sort of like speaking to him with all this thundering denominations and all this storm coming down and rain falling and everything else. And Casca, Gorgeous. Casca was just like, oh, and that was when it went to his lips and that's what, when it started purifying his body. It's almost like a vampire. Vampire, vampiric sort of transformation. It's very similar to that, isn't it? It's very yeah. similar to that transformation. Yeah. Yes, it is. Yeah. And it's described quite well by um, Cask, uh, by Barry Sadlin in that first book. And um, I touch on it in some of the later books because, you know, if you don't read number one and you just pick up my stories, it needs to sort of be retold a little bit. So that's what I've done. I mean, you can come up with another excuse for it, right? Jesus doesn't have to be the son of God. Jesus can be some other kind of being, couldn't he? I mean, you could answer this longevity thing and give well, it a different kind of curl by making Jesus something that, you know, modern do. world doesn't think of himself. I, I mean, know. Sadler himself had Casco wondering over what Jesus was. Yeah. You know? He said, well, there's no doubt he's some sort of demigod, but I don't know what he was. You know, whether he was the son of God, I don't know. There's, there's that doubt in Casco's mind. It makes me, it really did flavor my writing. I mean, it makes me want to write about a world in which a Jesus figure isn't necessarily a son of God, you know, as we know it. It'd be something else completely. Well, that's Um, the good thing about fantasy series, you see. You can write whatever you like, which is why I like writing the Castania series and the Dark Blade series, the two other series that we haven't mentioned yet. Yeah, let's get into those. I mean, I know we're reaching close to the time that you got to go, about an hour. Um, I I just, I I have to to apologize. I mean, just the idea. (laughs) <laughs> 20 <minutes. laughs> the talking about casket really does interest me a lot it's one of my favorite series and that i've been aware of you for a while so you know i'm on your website and i never comment because i don't do that but i'm looking i'm you know occasionally on there and i see that you've written other series and we talked about the rock and roll one which one is your third favorite <laughs> It's difficult to say. I mean, Dark Blade's easy to write because it's a smaller set of stories. And it's, um, I suppose, in many ways, a similar sort of thing to the Siren. In that I take a girl who is quite young and has a disadvantaged situation mm. and becomes something more um, as the book goes on. But Dark Blade's a fantasy series. I can just go bang and, and go wherever I want with this. Um, she's a uh, half dark elf, half human. She's kicked out of her village because the superstitious people there or humans don't like dark elves they're frightened of them her she never knew her father her mother dies on her 16th birthday of cancer she's quickly tipped over the um the side of a boat because they're living in a fishing village and then she's told that they don't want her anymore and she's got to go and she finds in her home um locked in a chest her father's heritage to her and he sends her on a kind of a quest to find out about herself and to, to become something more. And the Dark Blade series, I've written four of those now, and the fifth one will come out later on this year in September. How she how she goes through this imaginary world of mine. I, I haven't even given it a name, but um, this, this sort of land that she's traveling, picks up friends and, and associates, and some drop off, some continue, um, as they do in these fantasy series. But it, it's a story of her developing and growing. Um, and, and confronting all these sort of uh, trials and tribulations that a young girl would. Uh, and she also discovers she has an evil other self. So she's a bit schizophrenic that way. So sometimes her evil self takes over, and other times she keeps control. So there's that additional uh, factor put in there. Um, so Dark Blade's quite easy to, to write. I actually wrote the first one in eight days. So that was mad. That's 70,000 words. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so but, uh, what, what, what do you type in a minute? <laughs> it depends on how many mistakes I make on the keyboard. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> so you're not a perfect typer. I'm the same way, exactly. I just look up and there's just red all over the place. Oops, yeah, okay. i got to spend the next 30 minutes fixing all that. I just think, oh, gosh, well, or something that, that line. <laughs> <laughs> so you have, you can, you obviously consider yourself a speculative fiction author, right? Yes. Yeah, because even the rock and roll series is kind of an alternative hi- history, isn't it? I mean, you it's, put it's it's odd because I actually do an awful lot of research for that one, and I actually 
put this fictional band and fictional character in factual right. time. You yeah. have to. So, and it has to be a real place. It has to exist. And people yeah. have to know and have interacted with Absolutely. it. Yeah, it's interesting. Everything you actually read, what happens in, in the world in the background actually happened at that time. Yeah. I mean, the first, the first book, the first page, uh, the first um, chapter, she comes downstairs on her 15th birthday. It's the 12th of October, 1979. Radio One is on and playing is Message in a Bottle by the Police, which was number one in the UK at that time. I go into that amount of detail. And in fact, the song actually gives her inspiration because the whole song, I don't know if you know about the, this song, the message in the bottle from, by the police, but it's all about being lonely. And at the end, it says, you know, I can't believe what I saw, a hundred billion bottles washed up on my shore. It seems I'm not the only one who's, who's being alone. And she Do realizes you... that, I'm sorry. that she, she's not the only one who's alone and, 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 yeah. no place, and she takes inspiration from her. Do you consider it alternative history when you're writing it? Um, no, I mean, Harry Turtledove does that, and he's he's the past master at that sort of thing. Yeah, I, it's I, actually, isn't he? I don't get into that kind of thing, no. I, I, I actually write factual history and put fiction in it. And someone actually once said that I'm a faction writer. And I said, what do you mean? He said, you write fiction, but in a factual background. So it's fiction. Because, <laughs> well, I mean, history a plays a huge part in all of your stories. And yes. that, I mean, not the fantasy, obviously. That's going to do its no, own fantasy's thing. Fantasy's my own. That's it. You've got the, the, <laughs> you have the world build that. You like. But you're writing in the real world. And I think that's fascinating. I mean, I would definitely consider you an alternative history writer because you take these these fake characters mm. and you put them in real world situations yeah. and they can't change things. I mean, you really can't make them change anything. Does your character ever win? You know, does she get nominated? Does she get number one or in the top hundred or anything? You have to read Siren to find out. <laughs> well, I mean, no. if she does, she'd be interacting with the actual world, and that would be an alternative history to what we're currently in. I well, mean, it gets... I'm lucky. I'm lucky in that I know a few people who've been in the, the rock world. Um, mm -hmm. One of the people who actually I'll be seeing tonight, she was the um, catering manager for bands like Iron Maiden in the 1990s. So there's an awful lot of stories that I, I get told and that I can adapt it to my um, um, the stories about Siren. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm fortunate. I, I, I knew I know a roadie who um, one of his tasks was to be a roadie for The Who. And so there's a lot of stories about rock bands that uh, I have at first hand. I want to get into the, the last series, but um, I'm curious whether you ever considered writing factual, you know, not factual fiction, I almost said exactly what yeah. you said, nonfiction, you know, historical narratives of, of Barry Sadler or, or, yeah. or English rock. I mean, God, it seems like you have such a, a intricate personal knowledge of, yeah. of, the, of, the, of the latter subject. I think Siren's a bit self-indulgent because it's all about the music that I like and I just wanted to sort of put it into print. And so all the songs that, they listen to and you know the sound check they did Judas Priest's uh, um, Breaking the Law you know I love that song it's brilliant and brilliant. Also the, the Stranglers you know No More Heroes one of the best opening lines of any lyric you know about Trotsky getting his ice pick in his head and I just thought it's fantastic and they do sound checks for those songs in, in the book um, so it's self-indulgent in that, that respect but no I, i'm not all this is self-indulgent though isn't it just the just the very act of sitting in front of a computer and typing in words you're only doing it for yourself until somebody else cares right well yeah and I, I pour so much emotion into it because you know it, it, you do leave some of yourself in in print and i do pour a lot of emotion to it which is why i get burnt out if i I'll go on a huge spree and my partner jane she just says oh go careful and i can't once i've got the um bug I can't be stopped. I'm like a runaway train. Yeah, it seems like it. <laughs> I mean, you. I have to. I mean, definitely, you have my respect. Uh, your work ethic is amazing. What is the fourth series about? The fourth series is the Castania series. That's the epic fantasy series, and it's about this world um, where Castania is the great empire. And it's dying. It's falling apart. It's lasted for a thousand years, but it's been ripped apart by internal faction fighting between the various rival houses and external powers that want to destroy it and take it for its take it take it all for themselves and at the last minute this general decides to take power he he, he topples the emperor in a coup and propels him and his family to the imperial palace 
and the stories about them, all of them, and what happens and how they try to avert disaster. And it's it's a little bit like Game of Thrones meets I Claudius. Um, and I was only aware of Game of Thrones halfway through writing the first book, The um, Empire of Avarice. And I have yes, never, there is other books. I've never ever seen Game of Thrones. I've never. Oh, you've not seen them. You've yeah. not read it either. No, I, I've deliberately kept away from it. I've read the books. I mean, I don't know if they're going to be here forever. The series is interesting. Though, the television series, I think they've done a really good job of of uh, translating fantasy to television. I don't know if that's ever been done before. Yeah. Maybe you could think of an example of a really great fantasy t- uh, TV series. I, I don't know if I can. Well, there's a lot of rubbishy ones. Yeah, there's a lot of bad ones. <laughs> we could talk all day about bad ones, but really good ones. That was so corny. It was awful. What was it? Xena, Warrior Princess. Oh, like, yeah, oh. right? And the Hercules is the same way. And they and yeah, they also I, had a Highlander I, series for a little while. Highlander right? series was dreadful. It was yeah. like, oh, well, really Highlander bad. 1 was fantastic. Highlander 2 really was really good. It was a really turkey. All really the rest bad. of them were horrible. Yeah. They really hit it out of the park with that first one, and I don't know if they hit it out of the park if they don't have Queen doing the soundtrack. I mean, honestly, Queen, I love, I love Queen. Right? I think they were a fantastic band. They're the best frontman ever, and the the way that they were, they're an anthemic rock band, and they were able to draw people into their music. And Roger Taylor's drumming was was great because it was almost done to the heartbeat of humans, which is why yeah. it's so successful. If you, well, if I mean, you it's interesting, play right? Drums you, play, hmm? you play a Queen song, you immediately recognize it. They've, they've, they've managed to transcend the genre. They are themselves. They are themselves. Queen is Queen. It's not rock and roll. It's Queen. It's Queen music. Rock band. Yeah. I don't know. I'm, yeah. So I, have you seen Bohemian Rhapsody, the new movie with, uh, no. about no. Brian? Um, no, I haven't seen it either. Here it's really decent. Um, man, you are a fantastic gentleman for being uh, willing to come on my show and, and talk about your career in writing. This has been a fantastic conversation. No problem. Um, what would you like people to know um, that is the most important element of, of your, why you do this? Why, why, why do you, why do, you do it? Enjoy it. Yeah. Enjoy so you, it's, wake, it's, you wake up in the morning to write. You know, it's, it's, not, it's not the money because I, I work for slave labor i exploit myself mercilessly <laughs> i mean I, I make hardly any anything out of it at all whatsoever but um the, 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 that's the tough um, part i mean honestly that's what you're saying you're selling yourself every second that's yeah what everybody says i mean it's the most it's the most horrid part about what you want to do as a writer or that you have to do as a writer yeah i know i mean the, the, the castania series i was going to actually do a little bit more about it because we only just touched on it but it's it's told from the different perspectives of all the main characters. So you've got the, the male, the, the emperor, and then you've got the, the his wife, the empress. It tells the story from her perspective. Then the eldest son, then the eldest daughter, and then you've got this four-year-old kid. You know, the beginning is from his perspective as well. So every chapter changes. It's a different um, member of the family's perspectives. <clears throat> so that's that's uh, that, that's an in- intriguing part of that series. You know, if people like that kind of thing. Um, it's not a continuous one person's view. It's from all different um, perspectives. <clears throat> so, I mean, do you like that? It's like a toy chest of characters and you get to manipulate them and know where they're coming from. There are no secrets. There are no secrets, no. There are no secrets. You know, I, I just like to explore different ways of writing. So it's, it's you know, in the third person. I mean, um, when the siren finishes, I will be dabbling with horror. So, um, oh, <clears throat> yes good for you um i mean yeah i understand why you do it what's the hard part about why what you do what's the hardest part about what you do coming up with a new storyline for casca because you know there's so many stories and you think oh, how can i write a different story it's the same old same old let's make it a little bit more interesting throw something else in there and it's coming up with something new casca in the future no casca on mars no <laughs> no, 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 not as over my dead body. Casca is a historical action adventure series. Just picture it. Casca, it opens and Casca's floating around Jupiter. A Casca story can go up to yesterday. So it only can take place in the past. 
Indeed. That's what it was all about. That's what Barry Sadler wrote it about. If Sadler oh, wanted it, and I just Troopers, realized also the doctor. Troopers, he would have done Starship Troopers. You've got all those stories out there. They've all it's all been done. Well, 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 the doctor honestly is his is his life, isn't it? When the doctor dies, he has nobody to tell the stories to anymore. Oh yes, he has. Oh, has that changed? I... Oh yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Read my later ones, yeah, particularly uh, sort of like the Viking or the. The Austrian. Well, the Austrian. I want them all forty-nine. I want them all. Go ahead. Number, four, number forty-eight, right? The see this the first series. The scene is in a park in Vienna, uh, where there's a flat tower from the old um, German occupation. I was there the previous summer, and I, I wrote down everything I saw. And so, what I've written down there is what I actually experienced myself. And then I put Casca and his new um, sounding board there. Narrator. So the, he never tells his own stories, right? He never tells his own stories, yeah. It's, would he ever want to tell his own stories? I mean, why does he even tell that doctor a story anyway after 1963 years? It's well, in, in the first book, of course, he's wounded, isn't he? And uh, He's on he drugs. Was, he's he comes back to him over and over and over again. He does. He's a compulsion. I think, I think Sadler wrote down it was a compulsion. He can't help himself. And it's uh, cathartic. It, it, gets, you know, it gets it out of his system. I don't know, man. I love it. It really, it's really interesting. I'm so happy that you're keeping it alive. Um, my my last two questions for you today um, are: What would you like? Uh, what are you consuming right now that you want people to be aware of? Movies, video games, books that you're reading. Anything that you think is so ex excellent that people should be aware of it. I haven't got time to do any reading apart from research. Oh, really? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I feel you, man. It's hard, right? Because you're constantly reading everything and nothing that you really. I've started so many books. I've I don't. Never, I've not finished so many. I've not finished a book in forever. I don't read fiction anymore because I do it all for myself. I don't watch any television. It's boring. It ceased to be a, a medium of entertainment for me. Um, the only thing I do watch on television are occasional sporting uh, events, and that's it. Are you a football fan or? You would cricket? call it soccer. But yes, football. Yeah. I'm a football fan. Um, I, I wouldn't have insulted you by calling it soccer, man. No. <laughs> Thank, <laughs> you. Thank you. Um, I also like cricket. That's a game I know nothing about. I, you don't need I know to. Very, very little bit. You don't need to. Not, I don't think half the English know about cricket, but it's there. Well, it is like one of the most popular sports on the planet, though. <laughs> it's yeah, so yeah. popular. Um, South Africa, the West Indies, Australia, New Zealand. Yeah, they all play it, and they're fanatical about it. Do, were you a sportsman growing up, or do you still play sports now? I used to play football and cricket. Um, and then I got a back injury. Um, oh. Yeah, um, I was actually playing football, uh, local park football, and I went up to head a ball, and this defender headed the ball just as I went to head it, so I headed him, and there was a, a blinding flash of black i landed on my backside compressed the spine and trap nerve knocked a tooth out as well so i, I came to holding my tooth in my hand sitting in a, a muddy penalty box and this fella lying out on my feet going ouch i said well get out of the damn way then and since then I, my, my back's given me gyp so I've, I've had to give up playing sport ah it's horrible that sucks yeah. yeah um where do you want people to find you on the world wide web or where do you want people to interact with um, you my website is www.tonyrobertsauthor.com. Are you on Twitter or Facebook or anything like that? Facebook. Um, Tony Roberts, my own name. Or there's a, a casca.net um, Facebook page. There's also a casca website called www.casca.net if they want to go straight to that one. Um, there's a link to my other website from that. So those are Tony Roberts Yeah. Okay. Okay, that's brilliant. Thanks and Brian, thanks for talking to me.